Cults are something that we've talked about a lot on this channel because the stuff that they believe in is wildly outlandish but also wildly entertaining. Cults have this habit of starting off all innocent and then just going completely off the rails into a world of madness. But while we have covered religious cults, doomsday cults and alien cults, there is one that we've not yet covered. Sex cults. Cults, of course, are always defined by the leader, who, out of all of the members, is usually the maddest of the lot. And today will be no different. If you took Hugh Hefner and mixed him with every mental illness out there and added about 10 gallons of narcissism and a great big pile of nonsense as well, you would get Adnan Oktar. leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon earbuds, you can enhance your listening experience with amazing quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. The new everyday earbuds are better than ever with an improved rubber look and feel that is both sleek and discreet, as well as including multiple optimised gel tips to provide that perfect fit for maximum comfort, sound and security, regardless of the shape or size of your ears. Raycons are now more adaptable than ever, with a built-in mic that allows you to take calls at the push of a button, they are compatible with both Siri and Alexa, and include three easy-to-toggle audio profiles for you to customise to your listening experience. There is also a noise isolation and awareness mode for audio transparency when you need it. They also offer 8 hours of playtime, a 32-hour battery life, and boast 50,000 five-star reviews. I use my Raycons every day whenever I am travelling, and sometimes Times when I need to shut out the noise around me so I can concentrate on work. So if you want to get some top tier earbuds while also supporting my channel then click my link in the description down below or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get an exclusive deal of up to 15% off your order. Adnan Oktar was born on the 2nd of February 1956 in Ankara, Turkey, and he was raised there throughout his high school years where he studied the works of Islamic scholar Saeed Nursi, who became a huge inspiration for Oktar. Not much is known about his early life since much of it was spent studying many different subjects. In 1979, Oktar moved to Istanbul to enter Mimar Sinan University. These years in Turkish history were full of violence and repression, which led to the installation of a military junta following a coup in September of 1980. The environment in Turkey was unstable both culturally and politically. They were threatened by Cold War politics and by clashes between modern secular Islamic groups and Islamic militants. While all of this was going on, Oktar would still regularly attend the Mullah Mosque in Findikla to pray regardless of the threats. The mosque was close to the Academy of Fine Arts where he studied interior architecture and since Oktar stood out as being fearless in his religious practice, he was described as a Sunni zealot. In the early 1980s, Oktar started to gather young students around him and share his views with them on Islam. While this all started very innocently and it was a pretty normal thing to do in universities in Muslim countries, the students that he attracted belonged to the socially active and wealthy families of Istanbul. And by 1984, Oktar had formed a group of around 20 to 30 people who were now all following him. What started as a group of people discussing Islam suddenly became a group of people who were coming just to hear Oktar speak and they saw his words as teachings. It was no longer a general discussion of Islam, but Oktar presenting what he believed Islam should be. 
They were then joined by even more followers who were private high school students who were also from wealthy, well-known families. Oktar was said to have presented his teachings gently and in a modern fashion to the children of the privileged class without intimidating them and likely stroking their egos a little bit to help his words land better. Oktar was described as a much more refined and urbanised version of his idol, Said Nursi. In his religious teachings, Oktar argued against Marxism, communism and materialism. Now, if he'd just left it there, he would have actually been kind of based, but then he had to go and ruin it by also spending a lot of his time refuting the theory of evolution and Darwinism, because Oktar felt that these things had been turned into an ideology that was used to promote materialism and atheism, as well as numerous other, in his view, negative ideologies. Oktar personally funded a pamphlet titled The Theory of Evolution, which combined mysticism with scientific rhetoric to attack the theory of evolution, but this pamphlet would only go on to make his following even larger. In 1986, Oktar enrolled in the philosophy department of Istanbul University. He was becoming kind of a celebrity, with Oktar appearing on the cover story of the Turkish magazine Nokta, reporting on how he gathered with his friends and held lectures at the local mosque. A lot of the university students participating in his lectures were mostly from Bosphorus University, which is one of the most prestigious universities in Turkey. So it's easy to see how Oktar became very wealthy very quickly, since all of his followers were rich and very devoted to him and his teachings. So naturally, the money would flow in. And with the money came power and influence, which made Oktar's name begin to appear regularly in the press, sometimes even in the headlines. A very handy thing for someone who has an ideology they want to spread. Everything was going well for Oktar, until later that year when he published a 550-page book titled Judaism and Freemasonry which was based on, based, based on conspiracy theories that universities, state offices, political groups and the media were all working together and society as a whole was influenced by a secretive hidden group which existed to break down the spiritual, religious and moral values of the Turkish people and, in Oktar's words, make them become like animals. What did he mean by that? <laughs> Either way, Oktar was very quickly arrested and charged with promoting a theocratic revolution, which earned him a sentence of 19 months in prison. And straight after he was released from this sentence, Oktar spent a further 10 months in a mental hospital where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which he to this day denies having. He said that he was not mentally ill, but he was being held as a political prisoner and this was punishment for the book he'd written. Throughout the late 80s and early 90s, Oktar continued to build a community of followers. These followers were extremely enthusiastic and they started to recruit at summer resorts on the coastlines of the Sea of Marmara and their main targets for recruitment would be the wealthy. The social organisation within the group became more hierarchical, with everyone in the group looking up to Oktar as if he was a divine being. During those years, Oktar ended his studies, and since he had already begun writing books, he decided to devote all of his energy to writing. This was likely due to the fact that he had a lot of rich people willing to do anything he asked of them, so he pretty much had no financial problems at all. In fact, he was probably using money to wipe his ass at this point. In 1990, Oktar founded the Science Research Foundation to hold conferences and seminars for scientific activities, such as finding out what the real underlying causes were of social and political conflicts, which 
As usual, Octar believed stemmed from materialism and Darwinism. Some of the media at the time caught on to Octar's organisation, describing it as a secretive Islamic sect which was cult-like in behaviour, and that they would jealously guard the secrets of their considerable wealth. And speaking of considerable wealth, in 1991, Octar was again arrested, but this time it was for possession of cocaine. But Octar claimed that the cocaine had been planted in one of the books in his library by the Turkish security forces, who Octar said were also spiking his food and drinks with cocaine. Oktar was later acquitted and not charged for the possession, but the more influence, money and power that Oktar gained, the more paranoid he became. In 1995, Oktar founded another foundation called the Foundation for Protection of National Values, which Oktar used to network with other conservative Turkish nationalist organisations and individuals. Some believe that this foundation may have been a way for Oktar and his cult to illegally influence politics by bringing in lots of people from many different walks of life. You know, think of the rubber band scene from Fight Club. Over the next couple of years, due to Oktar's behaviour, people started to distance themselves from the foundation because they didn't want to have any political or personal connections with Oktar, at least not publicly. Not only because Oktar was receiving a lot of heat for a book he just wrote that was literally titled The Holocaust Deception, but people went with their gut and they knew that some bad shit was about to go down. Due to being arrested over his first ever book, whenever Oktar wrote any of his books, he wrote them under a pseudonym, Harun Yahia. So people within his circles and within the foundations knew that Oktar was the real author, but the general public didn't. The book, of course, sparked controversy because... <laughs> well, well, you know why. A Turkish painter and intellectual named Bedri Bakum published a strongly worded critique of the book in Ankara's daily newspaper, but because of the power Oktar had gained, he quickly issued a legal suit for slander to try and get the article censored. However, this was a very, very bad idea for Oktar because even though he wrote under the pseudonym of Harun Yahia, by Oktar suing this guy for slander, he was confirming to everyone that he was the real author of the book. So basically, in trying to get the article censored, he, he doxed himself to the world. This did cause quite a bit of damage to Oktar's image, but not too much. After all, his main audience were Muslims, so, yeah, yeah, yeah you know. In September of 1999, Oktar was arrested and charged with using threats for personal benefit and creating an organisation with the intent to commit a crime. After a court case that lasted for two years, his charges were eventually dismissed. Then, a couple of years later, a major event happened that was very relevant to many Muslims all over the world, and that was the attack on the World Trade Center on September the 11th, 2001. Oktar published a book in response to the attacks, and the book was titled Islam Denounces Terrorism. Throughout his life, Oktar had organized hundreds of conferences on creationism in Turkey and the rest of the world, so he could further grow his following. He built a large publishing enterprise with his books selling through Islamic bookstores worldwide. This allowed him to avoid censorship, but it was mostly to spread his philosophy as far as he could. He was considered one of the most widely distributed authors in the Muslim world. In 2006, Oktar released his most well-known book titled Atlas of Creation, which weighed nearly 5.5 kilograms and had a bright red cover with almost 800 glossed pages. Most of them were very well illustrated, and Oktar then, unsolicited, 
just sent copies of it to every university and intellectual society he could think of. A biologist named Kevin Padian from the University of Berkeley said that people who received copies of the book were absolutely astounded by the book's size and its beautiful production value. And they were even more astounded by what a giant pile of driveling, incorrect bullshit all of it was. Oktar then began preaching about forming a Turkish Islamic Union, which he believed would bring peace to the entire Muslim world under the leadership of Turkey. That's actually been attempted quite a few times in the past, but you know, Deus fault. In 2007, Oktar then sent out thousands more unsolicited copies of his book, Atlas of Creation, which now had extra volumes added. Oktar was trying to also advocate for Islam and creationism to be taught in schools and colleges in Europe and the USA. Oktar became an extremely litigious individual. With the money, power and influence he had gained, he spent many years engaging in around 5,000 libel suits with varying results. In some cases, he was successful in blocking high-profile websites in Turkey for slander, even winning a suit against Richard Dawkins as well as the complete WordPress website. His publications argue against evolution, saying that evolution denies the existence of God, abolishes moral values, and promotes materialism and communism. Oktar even argues that Darwinism, specifically all that survival of the fittest stuff, actually inspired racism, Nazism, communism, and terrorism. And if anyone dared question any of this, well, you would get a nice little letter from Oktar's lawyers. As we have already discussed, some of the content in Oktar's books included a number of his conspiracy theories, beginning with his book, Judaism and Freemasonry. Oktar thought that the Torah itself had a materialist standpoint which contained evolution theory, and that it encouraged an anti-religious, you know, the Torah, that famous religious text, he felt it encouraged an anti-religious and immoral lifestyle. Oktar also believed that society as a whole had been indoctrinated by Jews and Freemasons. Do, do any of you have any idea how hard it is not to make jokes? It's like, I, <laughs> I, want, I want to make jokes, <laughs> but I also don't want a strike. His theory of a global conspiracy of Freemasonry is explained in his book, Global Freemasonry. According to Oktar, Freemasonry is the main architect of the world system based on a materialist philosophy, but they keep their true identity concealed. I mean, I mean, they don't, and no Freemasons, they'll just, uh, they, they, they just tell you. Oktar uh, called the theory of evolution a Masonic conspiracy initiated by the Rosicrucians. He essentially thinks of them as something close to the Illuminati. Oktar's books repeatedly declared Darwinism and materialism to be conspiracies responsible for terrorism. In some of his books and interviews, Oktar uses atheism to condemn Zionists and the Freemasons by adding the word atheist before them, like atheist Zionists and atheist Freemasons, since they don't believe in the one true God. In 2001, the Stephen Roth Institute of Tel Aviv University listed Oktar as a Holocaust denier, you know, due to the publication of The Holocaust Deception, you know, it was a little bit, you know, kind of obvious. But three years later, the Institute changed their mind and they felt that Oktar had increased his tolerance towards other religions, saying that he now works towards promoting dialogue with other religions, calling upon all Muslims to have a tolerant and friendly attitude towards people with differing beliefs. In 2006, Oktar released another book about the Holocaust called The Holocaust Violence. The book was a complete 180 compared to the last. The Holocaust Violence stated, and I quote, 
The Nazis subjected European Jews to indisputable and unforgivable cruelty during World War II. They humiliated, insulted and degraded millions of Jewish civilians, forcing them from their homes and enslaving them in concentration camps under inhumane conditions. Certainly, the Jewish people, of whom 5.5 million died in concentration camps, were the worst victims of the Nazi barbarity. Meaning that... Oktar had either changed his mind or this was merely a political move to cover up for his earlier book. Personally, I think it was the latter. In 2007, during an interview with The Guardian, Oktar even went as far as to completely deny writing the Holocaust deception. And in an interview the next year with the German paper Der Spiegel, Oktar claimed that the Holocaust deception had been written by a friend who had published the book under Oktar's pseudonym, Harun Yahia, without his consent. Oktar said that only the second book reflected his own opinions. In 2009, Oktar expressed his new views on Jews by saying, and I quote, Hatred or anger toward the line of the Prophet Abraham is completely unacceptable. The Prophet Abraham is our ancestor and the Jews are our brothers. We want the descendants of the Prophet Abraham to live in the easiest, pleasantest and most peaceful manner. We want them to be free to perform their religious obligations, to live as they wish in the lands of their forebears and to frequently remember Allah in comfort and security. So... Why this sudden shift, you know, apart from the obvious damage control? Why this complete 180 of his views? Well, putting it very bluntly, the Holocaust deception had affected the money flow into the cult. So, in order to keep that money rolling in and not to alienate potential new cult members, Oktar claimed he respected everyone. However, that same year, the Anti-Defamation League described Oktar as an anti-Semitic Turkish writer that demonises Jews who support Israel as godless, and he blames them for committing atrocities. The ADL also argued that Oktar quotes a Holocaust denier named Roger Garodi, and he still cites his book that he didn't read, The Holocaust Deception, in articles on his own website. Though, let's all be completely fair, the ADL is a joke that thinks everything is anti-Semitic. In 2010, Oktar made it into the top 50 of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Centre of Jordan for his dissemination of creationism in an Islamic context and other extensively distributed books on Islamic topics. Although the reason that the books were widely distributed is because he just kept sending them all over the world to everyone without asking first. However... Later, Adnan would find a much better method to spread his message. Now, I realise it's been a long drag to this point. I know, I completely understand. However, it's mad lads, we need to cover everything, right? You're all still wondering, well, what is so mental about this guy? Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, we've now arrived at the good stuff. A year later, in 2011, a Turkish television station started broadcasting... A9 TV, which had an emphasis on creationism over evolution and Darwinism. Most of the content featured on the channel included Oktar himself, who acted like a televangelist where he had his cult members on full show. Mostly the women, who Oktar referred to as his kittens. And they were all clearly massive fans of plastic surgery. I mean... I'm sorry, there's nothing at all attractive about that. That's just some uncanny valley shit. However, there were male followers who Oktar referred to as his lions, but they were a lot fewer and they would always sit at the back of the show. Now, when you imagine a TV show that wants to talk about Muslim creationism, philosophy and Islamic scripture, you would envision a bunch of Muslims sitting around a table having a deep intellectual dialogue with each other. You know, like on memory TV. However, 
when people tuned in to Octal's show, this is what they saw. Violated the law. Pay the court a fine or serve your sentence. Now, I'm no Muslim. But none of that looks very Quran to me. However, Octal's show was actually a massive hit across the Muslim world. And, and I think we all know why. Throughout his life of writing books and appearing on the show, Oktar would talk about his love of women. And in one of his earliest experiences, Oktar said, and I quote, I used to kiss the bottom of my mother's feet and say, here I find the smell of paradise. Oh, oh. Oh, right then. Some people uh, even described Oktar's group as an Islamic feminist cult. You know, Islamic feminism. Nah, it's not worth the strike. Journalists from the West would visit the studio to meet Oktar and learn about his group, but they would soon learn that not only were the group complete fucking hypocrites, they were also extremely paranoid of outsiders. The studio contained luxury houses full of extremely expensive items, and it was described as being like MTV cribs. I mean, the, the cult, or whatever you want to call them, were just complete hypocrites, you know, I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear. I mean, just look at this. Does this, does this look like a man who is against materialism? Before the journalists were allowed to enter, they would have to go through a security check and cameras were not allowed at all. Any outsiders were told that if they wanted footage, it would be provided by Oktar and his followers, which, of course, only showed them in a positive light. Cults being secretive is pretty standard behaviour for them, albeit very concerning. And Octar's A9 TV show was still a massive hit. Things were going very well. People just thought that Octar was a bit of an eccentric gentleman with an awful lot of money, which of course is why he was always surrounded by all of these plastic women. However, for a good number of years now, there had been rumours. You know, sometimes people would escape the influence of the cult and they would start to say some things. They would start to talk about some very horrible things that were happening within the cult. However, if they ever tried to go public with any of this information, they would very quickly be visited by Octar's lawyers which is why the general public at large had absolutely no idea about these rumours because Octar and his influence were very good at making sure they didn't get out. However, eventually, these rumours reached the Turkish government and they started working behind the scenes and they found out about some of these sinister things that were going on within the cult. And then once the Turkish government had saw enough, they brought the hammer down. In 2018, seemingly out of nowhere, Oktar's cult was prescribed as a criminal organisation and Oktar and dozens of his followers were arrested in simultaneous nationwide raids where the police found an awful lot of damning evidence. But the public were still completely in the dark. What the hell was going on? Why did the police react in such a massive way, seemingly out of nowhere? Why had all the cult members been arrested? Well, none of that information was made public until Octal's trial. It turns out that when it came to the women and children who were members of the cult... Oktar had been raping all of them. All of them. As well as a vast array 
of other crimes. During his trial, Oktar was extremely arrogant to the judge throughout the entire court process, and he would boast about having over a thousand girlfriends and bragging about his sexual prowess by saying things like, I am extremely potent. I mean, not good things to say to the judge during your rape trial. Oktar did try to stress how much of a woman respecter he is by saying, and I quote, There is an overflowing of love in my heart for women. Love is a human quality. It is a quality of a Muslim. However, yet in another show of hypocrisy, one of the female victims from the cult spoke anonymously at the trial, and while giving evidence, she stated that Oktar had sexually assaulted her and all the other women in the cult, forcing all of them to take contraceptives. A little piece of evidence that supported this claim was that during the police raid on Oktar's mansion, they found 69,000 contraceptive pills. Oktar claimed in court that these pills were used to treat skin disorders and menstrual problems. All 69,000 of them. But it was also found that Oktar didn't care too much about the age of his victims, as very many of them were underage. Women who tried to escape the abuse, were then imprisoned by Oktar so they couldn't leave the cult. Many of them were forced to receive tattoos and then have naked photographs taken of them to use as blackmail. The reason that they had to get tattoos was so that the women couldn't deny that the pictures were of them. Sometimes Oktar would make bizarre demands, like telling the women to shave their eyebrows off in order to humiliate them. And not only had Oktar been forcing himself upon the women, the cult had also been threatening and apparently torturing people in high places in order to make them do what they wanted. Or Oktar would invite government officials or other high-ranking people to one of his infamous parties. He would hook them up with a cult girl and then secretly record it and threaten to send the video to their wives as a form of blackmail. Where have we heard that before? The cult even went as far as kidnapping children so they could blackmail their parents. Another horrible thing that was uncovered was that the male members of the cult would allegedly be elected as champion of the day, week, or month, etc. based on the number of women that they had forcefully had sex with. And men with lower numbers would be accused of being gay. There was so much stuff uncovered during this trial that there really isn't time for me to go into it all. And I want to at least try to get this video monetized. But the reason that all of this was able to continue for so long and how the public had absolutely no idea about any of this wasn't just because of the power that the cult had over its own members and it wasn't just because of Oktar's litigious nature where he would send the lawyers after anyone who even thought of blowing the whistle. It was also because of the blackmail that the cult had on high-ranking people. This allowed them to continue like this in secret for so long. But eventually, the government had enough. So, for various crimes which included leading a criminal gang, sexual abuse, sexual abuse of minors, and engaging in political or military espionage, in 2021, the Istanbul court sentenced Adnan Oktar to 1,075 years in prison. You know, a year for each girlfriend he claimed to have, with other members of the cult also being given very harsh sentences for their parts in all the crime. As far as we know, the cult has now broken up and is no more. It's amazing to think that this man was able to get away with all of this for so long and the public had absolutely no idea and how he was just totally enabled and protected by everyone around him even though given his luxury mansions, cars and jewellery and so on he 
clearly did not believe in any of the things he was preaching. I mean, if a guy tells you he hates materialism, but he has a Rolex on his arm, he, he just might be a complete fucking liar. But with over a millennium in prison for being a disgusting piece of shit, I don't think we'll be hearing any more of his bullshit anytime soon. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!